Welcome to Human Potential at Work, the show where we explore social impact, inclusion, and empowerment of everyone, including persons with disabilities. Get ready to be inspired, hear success stories, and learn tips and principles for bringing out the best in everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Deborah Rue, and this is Human Potential at Work. As a reminder, I am the CEO of Rue Global, and we are market influencers and strategists for the community of people with disabilities in the aging market. Today, my guest is somebody that I recently met, but have you ever met somebody and you feel like you knew them your whole life? That's, that's the way I feel with Mike. So I'm welcoming Mike Gifford from Open Concept all the way from Canada today. So uh, Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Deborah. Yeah. So Mike, fun. yeah, even before we start, you have some really good news. You had something important to happen this summer. So, uh, and as you know, I, I thought it was cool. So do you mind just telling us what you did this summer? Yeah, I, I got I got married and it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and it was, uh, I'm a Quaker and so it was done as a, Qu a Quaker ceremony. And it was was, uh, was quite a, uh, a wonderful celebration of, of the time that me and my, my now wife have, have spent together and the, the life we've built. So thank you. That is so cool. And I have never been to a Quaker wedding. And so I'm looking forward to seeing all the pictures and, uh, and it, I, I bet it was really cool, but I, I just wanted to do a nod to that really important um, Thank you. thing in your life. So Mike, tell us who you are. Tell us why you care about accessibility and digital inclusion and future of work and all of us being included. Tell us more about who you are and your company. So um, I'm uh, the president of Open Concept Consulting and, and Open Concept is a web development company. We work with uh, Drupal, which is an open source content management system. Um, and I guess it was about 10 years ago, um, I decided that, that uh, it was a, I wanted to sort of look at, at accessibility issues. And I thought that, that there, was a, there was a good opportunity to try and, and learn about web accessibility and to make improvements in, in the, the web accessibility within Drupal core. And, and that, that became a, a, um, um, a bit more of an obsession than I had originally anticipated. And <clears throat> suddenly I, I was, was involved in, in hundreds of patches and, and, uh, and issues and, and was, was able to go off into, through the, through the decade that I've been involved in the Drupal community, help to move two to 3% of the internet to be more accessible by default. Uh, we were able to go off and, and actually fix, fix many of the problems of web accessibility at the source, and, and by by working with with a large community that's that's actively developing on on this this uh, this very popular software tool, uh, we were able to to make sure that we could um, that we, we could go and 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 address address accessibility problems um, early and make sure that as soon as they were fixed that they could get, be rolled out to a million websites around the world. Just because this is an open source platform where you have a whole bunch of people who are using and modifying and, and um, you know, up, updating their, their, their software. Um, and I guess in terms of how it became involved, I mean, that's, that's sort of the more technical business side of things, but it, it's, it's um, um, my, my interest in, in accessibility has, has really come from, has been informed by, by a close friendship with, with a, a friend named um, Alan Shane, who's, who's uh, uh, has cerebral palsy and has, has, uh, has been um, working to to both educate me and 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 uh, hundreds of other people about um, the rights of people with disability and and, to, and, and how to go off and, and to in, how to think about inclusion and uh, so it was, was was really through that that experience that, that I um, that I came to 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 where I am now. Yeah. So uh, just for uh, since we have we have audience in 86 countries, which is wonderful. Wow. And I know it, it's just such a blessing. Mm -hmm. I think people really care about these topics. And so let's just dig in to accessibility just for a minute. And so mm -hmm. I have been in the field since 2001 when I created a technology firm that focused on ICT, Internet Communications Technology Accessibility. And in the United States, of course, we have multiple laws in our books that say that our websites need to be accessible for all of us. But this is a real issue when it comes to employment, too, because mm -hmm. if your technology is not accessible, not only can I not apply for a job with you, and maybe I can't, if I need accommodations, I can't get through in the, the employment process. If I'm lucky enough to get hired, yeah. then hopefully your intranet and your apps and your software and everything that you're using, your, your benefit system, your 
you know, everything is accessible to the assistive technologies that I might use. Otherwise, I'm not going to be as successful as other employees. So it's a huge issue. I'll also say, Mike, that with my own experience of working with hundreds and hundreds of corporations to get them accessible, mm -hmm. one thing that we saw happening over and over now, <clears throat> um, that was a company that I merged with another company in 2011. Right. But still, we would have very large corporations coming to us and say, we need to be accessible. We don't want to get sued or we have been sued, but we need to be accessible. And so we would manually work with them to create a framework, um, test it using uh, technologists with disabilities, assistive technology. We would follow the W3C WCAG rules. We would do all this and then we would teach them, we would even train them how to do it themselves. And yet a few months later after, you know, we were all done, yeah. we would go back and they were not accessible at all. It was like, we'd never been there. Right. And I thought, that's not good. I don't feel like I'm doing the right thing by my community. And yet that is how we're telling everybody to make technology accessible. It, it, it is, it's, um, it's a real challenge. Cause I mean, the, the, the steps aren't wrong, but but the, the effort has been on, on technical compliance and checklists, as opposed to thinking about what are the systems that are creating the technology and, and implementing it, and, and how do we make sure that the culture of the organization changes so that it supports the, um, there's a, a real intention and intentionality about how things are, are being done. So uh, one of the things that, that, that makes uh, Drupal stand out, stand out compared to many other um, content management systems is that we've we've tried to go off and address um, ATAG, which is the Authoring Tool Accessibility Guidelines. And this is basically an effort to, to say, we want to make sure that all of our, our publishing tools are both um, accessible to, to people who are, are um, they're, they're both, you know, the, the, someone with a disability can access the, the back end and, and edit and administer and, and develop on the, that, that, that platform. But we also want them to be able to, um, to look at at uh, the 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 side of being able to produce more accessible content, we want to make it make it easier for content ed editors to produce accessible content because everyone's pushed, and we've got these powerful machines that rarely are doing anything to go off and to to make it easier for people to um, to make content accessible. And so, you know, we can we can do so much more to try and and bring bring this technology in to help us make accessible content, but it has to be an intentional choice. Um, but there's, there's things we've done within Drupal like to, to make sure that there's a, um, that images are, 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 all text is required by, by default on images. And, and this is a, a really useful basic way to, to um, help um, ensure that, that the lowest hanging fruit of accessibility is, is dealt with. And, um, and all text really is one of the low hanging fruits. And and it's 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 something that that um, people are all excited about about using artificial intelligence to go off and to populate images and say, well, you can to a limited degree, but without any sort of sense of the author involvement, you're you're really really stuck. Um, but but the, the cultural change I think is 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 um, is a big one and and something that 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 people don't necessarily think about making sure that there's a commitment from the CEO down that to make sure that there's a um, there's there's changes in the procurement policy to see that that we're not just going in and um, looking at fixing what we have right now, but we're setting up systems so that any new technology is addressed and that we have agreements with our vendors to be able to to help upgrade their their accessibility their products and to not just think about the, the, that accessibility from the point of of the the, um, the the end user of what is is being what an, what an anonymous user would see. But to actually see this as as an editor, as a full participant, and, and as as staff and volunteers uh, with disabilities engaging in with these products and creating that content. Yeah, and and then you think, okay, well, because recently um, we've had a lot of disruption in the accessibility industry here in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's been mergers and activity acquisitions mm -hmm. and investor activity, and I've had multiple investors over the last few years. Uh, you know, quite a few call and talk to me about this industry as they're doing their due diligence. Right. And I, I keep saying to them, I think a, a couple of things that we've done has confused the industry. I think 
in the United States, it, it, just the way we do things is that we create laws and then we sue each other to pound those laws out and figure out how they work. Right. I have other countries saying, why are you doing that? It's like, well, <clears throat> I can't tell you why we're doing it, but that's the way we do it. And, and we actually have had impact outside the United States because we are litigiously holding our corporations accountable and others. Right. So <clears throat> whether it's a harder way to do it, doesn't matter. That's just the way we do it. For sure. But they were saying, the, the investors were saying, well, you know, why is the way I first described how we were doing, which is a very typical way of a service provider um, consulting group handling accessibility, why is that not working? And I said, well, part of the reason it's not working is because you're asking us to take a technological problem and to solve it in a manual way, right. which is never going to work because technology is shifting so quick. Sure. So, which is why I was intrigued about what you're doing, but also because this does tie into digital inclusion and the future of work. And when we look at what is digital inclusion and, and open source, well, how can we talk about accessibility with open source? But also my the way I envision and a lot of other people are envisioning the future of work is that we will be able to accommodate ourselves. So right. if this weekend I hurt my back and I really need to stand up at work, I have the ability not to have to go to my manager and say, I hurt my back, you know, yeah. or I go to HR, but I can actually just, you know, change to a stand-up desk or I have the ability to have a stand-up desk myself. I just change the position of my desk. That's right. just a small way. But the, there are other really creative ideas where you build the assistive technology right into the sort of the, the network so that if I need to pull it down. And so let's talk a little bit, first of all, about what you consider digital inclusion and then also why you think this is so important to the future of work. I mean, um, so I think that it, that the digital inclusion is is it's really trying to make sure like, th this is our our new public square. It's our new marketplace. It's our it's it's how people interact with. It. It's it's there's the whole um, in real life versus digital life. It's like no no. It's it's just life. It's it's it's, it's blended together. And if you if you can't access your your digital world uh, for whatever reason, then then you're you're very much handicapped to to be able to 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 function in your life. And so we can. Um, we can try and find uh, ways to be able to to um, yeah I, th I think that that, that that that's that's been a real a, a real challenge. Um, we can um, in terms of, of inclusion and and the, the future of work. I think that the the accommodation paradigm really has to to change because it's that model hasn't really seemed to have worked. And I think that there's just so much right. loss of of, of um, loss of productivity for businesses. Um, but also just just the the anguish of of people who are whether you're you're just temporarily um, disabled or whether you have a situational disability or whether it's it's a an issue of of, of having a long term permanent disability a lifelong disability there's the the anguish of not quite being able to fit in and not being able to 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 be involved with other other people has has really lost a lot of of human capacity and so. So I would like to go off and see rather than the, the current model where people have to go off and and basically say, you know, hi, I, I need a I need a, a special uh, dispensation and help me go off and and, and uh, accomplish what I need because I don't have the, the tools or the technology. I'd like it to be more a situation where where people are actively engaged in trying to go off and identify their barriers and to try and and that they're encouraged to try and fix them, not not. I mean, yes, with their manager, their manager needs to be involved in, in, on some level, but but to try and fix those problems at the source, to be able to say, how do we try and get people as quickly as possible to go off and identify uh, problems that they're they're running into, to know where where the issue is, like is, is it an issue of of um, uh, a screen reader not being able to go off and and, and read a, a you know get get through a menu structure or to to go and, and access a um, a block of text, or is it a problem with um, with with a, a, a keyboard only user um, not being able to to see different elements. Um, I mean, people are using assistive technology so much to help them function more effectively. Um, whether it's mm -hmm. it's the um, the people who who have um, who are, are working in a second or third language and and need to have some um, maybe they're not as good at reading um, in in one language and and so they want to have it read out loud for them so they can go off and and. Um, see the the uh, or they can hear the, the the conversation and participate in the conversation more clearly, um, or people who have dyslexia. Like it's it's just 
mm -hmm. is try to, to open up these tools so that people have the option to go off and to reach out and enable them if it's useful for them to be more productive and to try out what works for them rather than having to go get a doctor's note or go to an occupational therapist and and to to you know try and determine whether or not that's going to be covered by their health plan or if that's going to be something that they're going to pay for right. out of pocket and how that that is is all going to be be adjusted it's, it's, it's much more efficient to be able to to allow people to to get engaged in, in helping to to well to 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 identify the barriers that they have and to to recognize that they can be involved in fixing those barriers and, and that's where where open source communities are really so valuable is that there's there's an opportunity there to go off and say you can be involved in in um, in, in actually fixing the problems for the tools that you use and you're not you're not um, dependent entirely on the whims of of a corporation that is right. you know may or may not make that that issue in their their you know in the feature list for for the next release of the product right it's it's um, um, you have the opportunity to go off and to make your issue a priority and, and, and possibly make modifications um, to that before, before it actually gets out to the, the uh, before it's actually released to the market. Right. And, and so a few, a few comments there. Um, first of all, let's talk about an example of where this went wrong. And <clears throat> so think about um, having to go to your manager mm -hmm. and admit to your manager that something is wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, that, that, you know, depending on where I am in the company, that, that might really be a very unfortunate situation. I remember a gentleman that was very high up in the United States government, mm -hmm. and he had a very serious disease. And he said to me, uh, we were talking about disability inclusion, and he confided in me that he had this. And I was like, wow, um, well, you know, how are you managing it? We were talking right. about it. And he said, well, I haven't told my, the senior people here, even though he was one of the senior people. And I'm like, well, right. what do you mean? He said, I know what's going to happen. I know that they're going to assume I need to retire and I'm not good enough. And, yeah. and so I thought that was just sad because of just the, 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 it, just this man and all that he brought right. to this workforce. But um, I know that in Colorado, this was years ago, there were two gentlemen that were hired at a corporation and they need, they use screen readers. Mm -hmm. And so they were hired, they went in, they were doing the training, they got out of the training, they went to their job, um, did an excellent job during their training. And the, the, um, the main application that they, everybody used to do their jobs in this corporation um, it didn't work with their screen readers. Yeah. And so, so what the company did was um, they let them go. Yeah. And I, and, and so then we do live in the United States. And so of course they were sued. And I, um, I just thought there, there's so many breakdowns to that. And also mm -hmm. th what we know for sure is that people with disabilities are innovative uh, problem solvers. We know right. this uh, across the board. Why? Why do we know this, Deborah? Well, because they really have no choice. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe everybody speaks a different language for them, and they can't hear the language that's being spoken. Or maybe right. um, they have they see the world in a different way, or they use their brain in a different way, like with autism or d dyslexia. Or uh, there's so many ways. Or I have mental health problems. I mean, there's, you know, there, there, we can really start digging into the pure complicatedness of this problem. Yeah. But the reason why I liked what you were doing so much was because you're really looking at it more holistically. And of course, when you involve the individual that is trying to solve some issue, they, they know what works best for them. For example, right. you assume all people that are that that are blind use a screen reader well it, that might be wrong i, I know people right. that are legally blind that use you know uh, they text, still yeah. have yeah they zoom text or magic or um you know the, the the tools that are built right into the operating system so this is not even only about assistive technology but mm -hmm. if you will give the individual a chance they can tell you what's going to best meet their own needs and they probably already know, but maybe there's a problem they don't know. It's a real major opportunity for a corporation to actually get it really right. And by the way, if they're having the barrier, others are having the barrier and customers are having that barrier. Yeah. It is, you know, it's not ever about one person. Yeah. And you're, I, I, I will be bold enough to say, if you think it is only about that one person, you're wrong. Yeah. Because as we age, I, I had one customer 
<clears throat> that we call their older customers that were not as good with digital laggers. Right. And um, I said, you know, I don't think that you should call the older customers laggers. Well, we're not, called, it's only a funny thing we do internally. Well, you know how that works. That's it gets right. out and somebody's talking about it on a show, but no, but you, you stop assuming that your customers are broken or your employees are broken and, and looking at this as being innovative. So then we go back to, you know, it, is it maybe it's, it's become less about the digital divide and it's more about digital inclusion because right. if we don't have access to, to technology and social media and digital and Wi-Fi, uh, your world, it, it, I mean, everything has gone digital. Yep. And, and then of also, we want to make sure in the future of work, as we continue to expand, what does it mean to work? And yeah. um, as the millennials and the Gen Z say, you know what, I'm not really interested in being part of a large corporation that is not including every, you know, other people. I, right. I just am not really interested in that. And as more people become interested in entrepreneurship, including entrepreneurship for people with disabilities, all of these things are all tying together. Right. And I know you're doing a lot of that work. And I found it fascinating that you were doing it from this open source because, you know, in the past that, that really terrified corporations. For sure. But now you've got Microsoft who used to be one of the big opponents of open source saying, you know, this is the way to go. And, and uh, you know, they bought GitHub. They're the largest contributor on GitHub of all corporations around the world. They're They've bought in, and uh, it could be the there's the new CEO sort of getting that there is a change out there, yes. and that they need to go off and reposition themselves in order to get the talent. Um, but I was thinking a bit about the um, when you were saying that about the, the future of of work, and 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 so much of of, of the future is going to involve um, machine learning or artificial intelligence and and, and that type of thing. Um, and and all of these bots, um, um, they require very much the same kind of information, structured information that people who are using assistive technology do. So that right. same semantic knowledge that you need to build into your web pages to make sure that they're conveying the correct meaning and that there's consistency conveyed to a screen reader is the same information that you need to go off and pass along to your artificial intelligence to make sure that they're accessing the same information as well. So when people are thinking about their investments in in as, as long as they're not thinking about it as as if they think about it as providing more meaningful content um, and and investing in providing better content, then it, it totally makes a lot of sense because that's going to benefit everyone. Um, and it, it, it's this is all just part of, of creating well structured, well defined content that can then be be extrapolated for for a screen reader user or for for assistive technology or or, or bots or artificial intelligence, like you. You need to have that knowledge in, in, in that structure in order to, and uh, the culture of producing well-structured content in order to be able to, to leverage, um, to, to, to really leverage the information that you have. And if you have right. a whole lot of legacy information in your, in your organization that, that does not have, that's not well-structured, then, then it's gonna, it's, you just sort of get garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't matter how, how good your, your, uh, your AI is, if you don't have well-structured data uh, at the beginning, it's going to be that much more difficult for them to actually be able to provide anything that's, that's close to meaningful knowledge um, through the process of, of, of throwing your assistive technology at the, uh, at the system so, or, at, or at your data. So you know, it's, uh, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of, of potential there as well. And, and uh, you know, I, I, um, I don't think that AI is going to solve all of our problems. Um, I think that AI is going to have a whole other series of problems that are going to you know, come from it. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> but they're going to, it's going to help. I'm, I'm going to help. all game for the AI. We've got narrow AI right now. So, yep. uh, I mean, yep. you know, but I, I was reading an article the other day that said, um, and I was really blessed to have Brian, uh, uh, Brian Reese on the, um, okay. I'm saying that wrong, Byron Reese on the okay. show. And he wrote The Fourth Age that's talking about artificial mm -hmm. intelligence and very, very interesting book. And uh, they were, <clears throat> as he was explaining and how it ties into the future of work and everything we're doing it he was saying a lot of people are afraid that artificial intelligence is going to take jobs away from us right. maybe maybe jobs away from people with disabilities which we don't want because we're already underemployed and unemployed as it is yeah. but really 
he doesn't think that, and many other people think that. They think instead, and I saw an article about this a couple of days ago, AI is going to take tasks away from us, right. but not jobs. So they're just like any other technology. Instead of writing things down, I can type it into the computer. You know, So yeah. there are things that it's going to take some of, hopefully a lot of more tedious tasks away from us and other tasks, you know, tasks that you know, we don't need to be doing necessarily, For sure. not entire jobs. It's going to, it should enhance the work we do and allow us to be more innovative and more creative. So I think, you know, there's a lot to, especially when it comes to individuals with disabilities and also another important topic to me, the baby boomers that a lot of people are deciding to write off people over the age of 55. And now that I'm over the age of 55, I'm very concerned about this because we still want to contribute. Many Mm -hmm. people, if I look at it from the lens of the baby boomers in the United States, 72 million strong, many of the baby boomers can't afford to retire or they are retiring and they're just creating another job. They're, they're just becoming entrepreneurs. Um, the gig reality, you yeah. know, the, you know, is, is really important to this population and deciding once again, we're starting to decide that a whole segment of people are not valuable to society. Yeah. And, um, and I just, I disagree with that because I think the more, we can really work to make sure we're all included, uh, that there isn't the, you know, that people have access to digital, um, that we're considering all these components when we're talking about future of work or blending in artificial intelligence intelligence or robotics and the IoT and how are the driverless cars going to, you know, tie into reducing a lot of the transportation barriers that our older citizens and people with disabilities right. often encounter and, and others, poorer people. Yep. And, you know, it, it's, I just think it's always fascinating to remember that as you're solving these problems, you are helping everybody else, which yeah. is why I was so interested in the work that your group was doing. So yeah, t- tell us tell us more about what you're doing. So uh, the, um, I, was, I was gonna say that the, the uh, um, one of the, the, the challenges, I think that AI can have that benefit, but really depends on what are the incentive structures that we build around that. So if, yes. if, if the only incentive structures that, that businesses have is profit, if it's just how much money can I make and can this quarter be bigger than last quarter, and how much right. bigger it's going to be? Then, then really, it's a race to the bottom. And and there's, it's it's who who is able to go off and to, to accumulate the most intellectual property, mm-hmm. and be able to go off and sue everyone else into submission. Um, yes. So my company is taking a very different route to this, which is that we're we're a certified B corporation. So um, our company is is uh, trying to go off and meet the triple bottom line. So we're. We're trying to be carbon neutral. We try and go off and do the best we can to go off and support our employees. We try to be involved in the community. Um, and we're trying to promote this, this type of business because we really need businesses to sort of be, to stand up and be responsible members of the community and be able to, to say that you know, we, there are things that we can do, uh, like trying to make sure that our offices are as accessible as possible and to make sure that we're, we're structuring our, our technology choices so that we, we can we can look to hire people with disabilities in the future and that we're not sort of excluding people because we've used, oh, we're, we're using this, this um, our whole project management tool is designed to, to work, uh, and it only works with, with uh, for, it needs um, a mouse in order to control your, your Trello card or, or whatnot. Like the, the, the whole project management tool depends on there being, being a, a mouse interaction to be able to control that. We want to avoid that so that, that people who, um, that we can employ more people and have more options, um, but also so that we can, we can have a greater impact in the work we're doing. Um, and, I, and I do think that we do need to, to think about the responsibility for businesses and the responsibility to, uh, to, be, um, to, to, do, to do more than focus on the bottom line. We need to really have a, businesses need to have an impact that is, is, um, is more significant. We, we've got you know, companies that, are this, that, that have a, uh, an economic base that's larger than many con- countries, and yet, right, yet the, right. the responsibility is, is only to, a, 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 you know, to their shareholders in many cases, which right. is it's not a big, enough, um, a big enough set of responsibilities. There's, there's other shareholders, whether that's the community, whether it's the environment, whether it's, it's their employees, and, and you know, there are other shareholders that need to be, be understood as, as, as having rights in, and, and, and that the corporations have responsibilities toward, the, toward those. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I agree. And, and I um, talk about that a lot on the program. And I was, um, I was watching Bernie Sanders on a talk show the other day. He's and good. he was talking about, I, I, I'm a big fan of Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, you know, once again, the disparity of wealth. And in my recent book, Inclusion Branding, I talk about the four P's. We understand that you need to be profitable. If you're not yeah. profitable, we're business owners. If you're not profitable, you can't stay in business. For sure. It's okay to be profitable, but it cannot be the only thing. And a lot of businesses still think it is the only thing, but yeah. I believe with all my heart, the world is shifting and we are watching. And if you are not thinking about the other three Ps, people, purpose, planet, then um, I believe the world is going to move away from you at some point. You might own all the money right now, but I believe in the power of humanity. I really do. And so I think that we are starting to see a shift. I know the young people are demanding it. I yeah. believe <clears throat> I believe that there is an awakening among the baby boomers. I think the baby boomers and their two separate uh, sections in the baby boomers, the older ones and the younger ones, I fall into the younger category. And often the baby boomers are looked at as, we broke everything, yeah. you broke everything. Um, but, <laughs> but actually there's an awakening happening. And yeah. I think there's quite a few of the people my age and my generation that are looking and saying, all right, we are going to look uh, we're going to pay attention and we're going to support what the Gen X's are doing, what the what the millennials are doing, what the Gen Z is doing. And this is not just about one country. Yeah. This is about all of us being together. So I, I want to talk just a little bit more. I want to make sure people understand who you are, Mike, and who your company is. So I know that we mentioned that you're in Canada, That's right. but I know that you're not just working in Canada, nope. that you're working with multinationals yep. all over the world. And so I want you to talk a little bit about that. And I also want you to talk just a little bit about the type of project that you would work on with corporations or, and I know you're not just working with corporations, you're mm -hmm. giving a lot of time back, your own personal time in your corporation and giving back, giving back. But I, I would actually like you to just give us a little bit of more of a commercial about who you sure. are, because brands are listening. I, I was really, I, I got to do a shout out for a wonderful brand. I had a woman on uh, from Guatemala, uh, Amanda, uh, a few weeks ago, and she was just telling this wonderful story. And I was saying, if you're a corporate brand listening and you want to help out in Guatemala, let us know. Royal Caribbean, Ron Pettit from Royal Caribbean contacted me the next morning and said, Deborah, we at Royal Caribbean, we have a call center in Guatemala. We want to help. God bless Ron. So I say the same thing. If there's anybody out there that wants to be understanding more about what Mike's doing and really uh, making a difference, really changing the world, you know, I want them to know what you do. So right. boom, back to you. So, so uh, um, we, we do a lot of, uh, most of what we do is, is, is we build Drupal websites and, and Drupal is, is, is something that, that uh, can be used, it's a, it's a very versatile tool. So um, we work with uh, educational institutions to, to build, uh, build registration packages so that people can um, log in and register for courses and, and that they can get assigned to classrooms and, and make payments and get certif certifications and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we also do things work with with unions and try and make sure that that uh, unions are able uh, that the members are able to go off and change their their um, their information and 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 uh, submit receipts and 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 do that all through the website and build a, a platform that interacts with with their back end finance pieces. So, so we've got a a consistent um, user interface for people to go off and to to really break down those barriers so that that you're not there's not a hard hard and fast barrier between the the external um you know what people do in their life and, and the website the website is really the front door for most most people's organizations and so we want to try and make that more more open and engage more with the workflows of, of how 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 organizations work with their clients and and make sure there's more of a um, an easy way to go from and for people to to come in and to 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 have the services that they need and to work with the professionals on the other end that they're, they're trying to interact with and then, then, then move from there. Uh, we work with uh, a lot of government agencies. So um, trying to go off and, and make sure that we're, uh, we're able to go off and help them. And the government of Canada is, is working to, to, uh, to update its, its Canadian Accessibility Act. And hopefully that will become 
uh, the law of the land in, in uh, you know, next summer. And we're, we're quite looking forward to what that will look like and what the implications would be. Um, so we work with organizations that are, are um, that are, are, are responsible with that and, and trying to go off and to set up and, and establish those, those best practices. And, and uh, we certainly have a lot of government clients that, that have uh, both, both in Canada and the U.S. who are, are working to go off and, and to, to meet those best practices and, and see how do we try and, and, and ensure that we're, we're, we're able to go off and, and to, 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 um, to build sites that are, are as, as structured as possible. The, the, um, I think the, the more, um, in terms of accessibility work, we, we do reviews on, on websites as well to try and help, uh, help them be able to understand how to fix this, the structure of, of their, um, their site, be able to say, how do we, how do we make sure, that, or not, not of their site, but of, of their systems. So, you know, um, there's so much that people are, are missing in terms of, 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 do you have a, a policy in place for, for a procurement? Do you have, uh, what are you doing to set up your, your accessibility statement so that it's actually meaningful? It's not just a, a piece of PR, but it's actually integrated in with the, the, the technology you're building. And there's actually providing cues for people with disabilities to be able to understand how to better access and discover how to use the site more effectively. Um, how to go off and, and to find ways to support multiple disabilities and so providing ways to, to make it easier for people to add preference editors so that you can support people who are low vision and who have dyslexia. Um, right. And trying to go off and support those those structures so that people are, are thinking about accessibility as a as part of a whole system and a whole system that their organization that, that, that needs to fit into their organization's culture and and needs. So so we're definitely moving into that space where we're, we're providing more um, more widespread strategic advice and direction on on you know, right. you know starting with the website but but going much beyond that in terms of how they how how organizations uh, approach their their technology procurement and their, um, their, their, their policies and, and frameworks around accessibility. Yeah, because accessibility is still a very complicated, it's mm -hmm. very complicated thing I, because technology is so complicated and it's still growing, it's still doubling every two yeah. years, processing speed still. And yeah. so <clears throat> it's, it's exciting and disruptive and stressful and, um, and a, a lot of these corporate, a lot of these, it's not, I, I just still love with corporations, but mm -hmm. a lot of them still have not figured it out and they don't know where to turn. And they're, <clears throat> they're really trying to, they're trying to do this, right. but they often, um, and, and it's really discouraging. And I hear this happening a lot in a uh, corporation in the U S would, will, will work with accessibility experts and, um, or at least people that, that say they're accessibility experts yeah. and they'll spend quite a bit of money and then they still are getting sued because their websites are inaccessible. I had a very large um, corporation that has many, many uh, locations come to me and say, uh, we're being sued because our websites are inaccessible. And I'm like, okay, well, you should make your websites accessible. Yep. You know I mean? They're, you know, and they said, well, we spent, and I'm gonna quote them, a substantial, amount of money with a vendor. And I said, oh, and they told me who the vendor was. Um, and it was a very, very large organization. Right. And um, that, to be honest, I don't typically see in this space. Right. And so I would not consider them an accessibility expert. And based on what <laughs> this company gets sued, yeah. they probably don't exist either. But it's, it's a real buyer beware. And I feel, I actually... I actually do feel really bad for the corporations in the U.S. and others because um, they're getting sued and sued and sued. And yet our community, I think our industry has not really stepped up enough and given these corporations real accessibility solutions, yeah. which is why I was impressed with what you're doing, trying to fix it at the core. Yeah. And there's a lot of good stuff happening. There's a lot of tools starting to come about that I think add value. There's a lot of brilliance in our space. But the reality is, it is still buyer beware. So, yeah, um, and it, yeah it's it just really is. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, even though we were contacted earlier this week by by a disability organization that hired a marketing firm to go off and build their website for them, and it's like. Well, that's not going to work very well. If you if, if accessibility is important to you, you you probably should find somebody who both understands accessibility and understands the technology. And, and right. it's, it's interesting in terms of the space because people are like generally people understand accessibility or they understand technology. There's very few people who understand both. And 
I and it's agree. you know not that I understand you know, all of it, but I I I, I understand enough well, of it. It's changing too fast. Yeah. I think anybody that says they know it all, I would say really because yeah. I've been doing it for a long time. I know a lot, but I would never say I know everything. That's right. And then so we have to it's be able to. Too fast. I mean, probably this is why why I also think that the open source approach is a way to go because we don't have to be you know we don't have to find the right answer forever with with every single technology stack out there. We can put we can put it out there and say this is what we think is a best practice. Is this the right way to approach for this? What are, how does this work with with people using JAWS and Chrome versus Firefox? How does this work with Dragon naturally speaking? How does it work with Zoom text? How do we keep right. evolving and changing the technology so that as new bugs are identified, that we can we can resolve those barriers and and find that that we're we're able to 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 work through and and to to address these issues. Um, so it's, it's a really hopeful space to be in, be able to actually not just identify problems, but to be able to, to actually fix them and to see, see that there's a community of people who are getting involved and who are investing in um, investing their time and energy in, in trying to, to make sure that these problems are things that can be uh, resolved, not just for, for this one website right now, but for you know, millions of websites going forward. Right, I agree. So Mike, tell the audience how they can find out, how, how, how can they get to you? With your social media handles, your website, tell us how to find you. Excellent, so generally I'm M. Gifford on Twitter and on most other places. Um, open Concept is my, my business and, and it's uh, openconcept.ca. Uh, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Certainly on, on Drupal, you can, if you look at any of the accessibility issue queues in Drupal, you'll probably find my name listed there. Uh, so there's, there's, uh, there's lots of ways to find me, but, but um, I'm quite prolific on Twitter. So uh, that's, a, that's an easy way to, to go off and to, to, to find me there as well. And I'll also say that he has a blog. And so I was, um, I followed his blog, but I was out actually last night out there looking at him. Boy, you've got some really, really good blog, blog topics out there. Thank so you. I would um, recommend you go to openconcept.ca and look at Mike's blog because it's pretty impressive. It's very technical, but this is what he does for a living. He's all about making the world a better place for all of us. So Mike, thank you for being on the show today. Thank I'm you, very Deborah. grateful. And congratulations on your wedding. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>